Hello and welcome to the 41st gathering of the Adventure Party on this, the 21st of February. I'm your party leader, Brad Ludwig. We ask that you peace tie your swords, holster your blasters, and make sure uh, you have well-crafted weapons for your characters in your adventures when you are gathered at the meeting table. Uh, our guest this evening is James Louder. And we're, we're really excited about this. Uh, he is known as an author, editor, and annual game gift giver extraordinaire. A few of his many notable works include Prince of Lies and Knight of the Black Rose, which, sir, I one of my favorite books. Oh, thank you uh, very much. RPG books. I absolutely adored that book, and I loved Raven Ravenloft. So. That was a uh, wonderful world to work on. It was, uh, uh, and I think I got the first, I got up until the uh, the dance, um, the zombie, I think it was the zombie book. I think dance of the, the Dead. Dance of the Dead, yes, thank you. Dance of the Dead, yep. Um, yeah, and then I, then I stopped collecting them, but I, I enjoyed the heck out of those books. Uh, and he has just finished work on a book of absolute silliness, which we are uh, here to mostly talk about. That is the Munchkin book, the official companion. Uh, for those of you who have uh, heard of Munchkin or have played Munchkin, uh, you, you probably love it. It is a wonderful card game from Steve Jackson Games, and uh, I've had many a fun time playing the different genre versions of Munchkin. It's not just fantasy. You can actually mix decks where you could have a fantasy Cthulhu, or you could have a sci-fi Cthulhu, or you could have a fantasy sci-fi um, it, it's just a wonderful, fun game for a group of people to just hang out and play together. So, welcome to the Adventure Party, James. Thank you very much. Uh, my second in command here is Glenn Bittner, and he is a movie reviewer on his YouTube show, The B-Movie Bunker, and also the creator of the RPG, Mist Runner. How are you doing, sir? I've been better. I made the mistake of picking up a duck in a dungeon. I should have known better than that. <laughs> uh, for those of you who have not played Munchkin, uh, <laughs> duck in a dungeon is one of the cards that can uh, cause you uh, some some harm in the yes, game. The duck of doom. <laughs> duck of doom. <laughs> Toy Fair is my duck of doom. Oh yes. <laughs> And uh, for those of you who uh, do follow us on YouTube, we did not have a show last week because Glenn was at Toy Fair this past week. And uh, I have a feeling at uh, some po point in time here very soon, we're going to pick your brain on some of the things that you got to see at Toy Fair. So. The heart of madness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, if you guys follow Glenn on Facebook, you probably got to see a lot of pictures of some of the things that he encountered at Toy Fair. Um, so uh, if you don't follow Glenn Bittner on... Uh, nothing Facebook, from Mattel. I signed my waiver. I obeyed it. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, you didn't get a full view of everything that happened at Toy Fair, but you got a, a good selection of, of some of the cool things that were happening at Toy Fair. So uh, check Glenn out on the Facebooks. So, uh, as always, we're going to do a roundtable uh, with our game review, game news, and uh, speak with James Louder about his Munchkin book that he put out. So uh, let's jump right into our game review, Glenn. What do you have for us? I have the game Battlesheep. Um, this was released uh, about three years ago now, almost three years ago, by Blue Orange Games, uh, created by Francesco Rata. It's two to four players, plays in about 15 minutes. It is a what is known as an abstract strategy game, meaning that it is solely a skill-on-skill -skill game. There's no really no luck involved in this game. How the game is played is you start by constructing the board. You have uh, hex tiles that you actually take turns placing out to create the game board. So the game board is shaped differently every time you play. And it's also shaped larger or smaller depending on the number of players you have. Fewer players, you play on a smaller board. Then each player has a big stack of sheep. They're basically these big, thick, heavy-duty pogs with different sheep on them. On your turn... You'll take as many sheep as you want from your stack, leaving at least one behind, and you'll move them as far as they can possibly go in a straight line, and then drop your stack there. 
the goal is you're trying to claim more of the board than anyone else. Because rules of movement are you can't move across empty spaces, meaning if there are gaps between the boards, you can't move across those gaps. You also can't move through any existing sheep, including your own. So it's a game of, of territory control, kind of like a like a simplified version of, like, say, a Go or something like that. That's going to be uh, familiar to people who have seen, hey, that's my fish, the mechanics for moving the pieces and controlling the areas. Is, that one will be familiar to them. Yeah, it's very similar to, hey, that's my fish. Um, the, the, the one difference being, in, in, hey, that's my fish, you're trying to collect the most fish. This one, you're trying to claim more of the board than anyone else. Um, and I, I love these kind of games. I'm I'm always hit or miss on, on some of these when it comes to my skill. Uh, hey, that's my fish. I'm okay at. I probably win about as often as I lose. Battle sheep, I, I've i just been an unstoppable juggernaut in. <laughs> I... I trounced the guy from Blue Orange Games when I played it the first time at Toy Fair, <laughs> who was supposed to be their pro, because I did something he didn't expect, and I've just I've been on a winning streak that is like twenty some games long, which for me is really really that's impressive for me, because normally in these types of games, someone comes along and does something I don't expect, because I don't I don't adjust well to new strategies. So far, everyone's on the same thing, so I've been able to predict what they're going to do because they haven't changed up. But <laughs> once someone does, great. Then I'll just become a better player because that's the thing with these types of games. You become a better player by playing people who are better than you. That's, that's how you improve in games like this. Yep. And it's also, I like it because it's it scales well in, in whether you have two players, three or four, because you reshape the board. So you're not, in some games like, uh, another one uh, called Blockus. If you play with fewer players, yeah. you have a lot more board to work with. So strategies change a lot, and it, it it's much easier to end in a tie because you have so much room to work with. Whereas in this one, it's very hard to end in a tie because you shrink that board if you have less players. You make it bigger if you have more. And there's other little nifty tiebreakers involved as well. As if you have the largest continuous block of sheep, you still get to get the win, which is how I've had to do it a couple times, where I've just managed to get that that big, concentrated area of all of my sheep. Plus, you get random languages of sheep. Uh, <laughs> every one of them is different on, uh, on all of your all of your different pogs. So. Um, but it's just, it's a good little filler game. It, it really does play, in, as long as you're not playing with someone like Randy, uh... <laughs> <laughs> about fi- about fifteen minutes. Okay. And good for kids too. It, yeah, it's, great a, for it's kids. a game that yeah, it's a game that's accessible to kids. No, oh, that's that's wonderful. And you know, looking at these pictures, we we always go to boardgamegeek.com when we uh, talk about the games, so the folks that uh, follow us on YouTube can actually see some of the images uh, of uh, some of the games and gameplay. And looking at these images. No two boards are the same because you are building yeah. the board. Right. Uh, so there's a high degree of replayability because no two games will ever be the same. And you'll something I have noticed most of the time when I show people how to play the first time, the board get, is very very compact because people just kind of place place things where they're like. Well, this should go next to something, so I'm going to put it and put it in here. And the next person just kind of builds off of that, and you just get this very large kind of circular all-in-one thing. And I'm like, no, man, branch out. You got to make it. This is this is too simple. You want to make it crazy and weird, but it's a good way to start. Um, but yeah, I love I love the variability in the board. It's one of my favorite aspects of the game. Okay, uh, how many people can play? It's two to four. Okay, okay. And uh, as we said, uh, very family-friendly. Um, gosh, about how much does it retail for, would you say, Glenn? Uh, about $32. Oh, wow. That's so, yeah. that's a steal. <laughs> for, yes, in the, in the market now, if it's under $50, it's kind of a win. Yeah. No, absolutely. And you know, as we as we've always said about games, if you're going to drop money for a really good game, you're probably going to be spending 50 50 plus to a yep. certain degree. 
Uh, but when you find a game like this, which does have a great deal of replayability, it is very kid friendly. Um, you know, thirty-two bucks. That's you're gonna definitely get your money's worth out of that. Uh, w playing with the family, so, and it's a fifteen-minute game, so you could easily play play a few games, and it won't take up a full day <laughs> to do so. And it's one of the nice things about family games like that too. Is sometimes. Um, hey, that's my fish is definitely like this. You can slide that into your adult gaming group and and play a couple of games in between longer things, and uh, and it's very entertaining even for that audience too because it's a it's a strategy game. It's going to depend on who you're playing with, what level you're actually competing at. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I've, I've used it as a kind of a palate cleanser in between longer games. Yeah. Right. No, and that's that's always a good thing to do because uh, when you play a long game, you know, like Game of Thrones, <laughs> <laughs> that takes up most of a day, um, that turns your brain to mush, and you jump into a, a quick game like this that uh, you know it just uh, that just sketches the brain, resets everything, and uh, lets you get back to other things. So, uh, no, this is a great recommendation. Thank you very much, Glenn. Absolutely. All one right. Of our, one of our bestsellers last year. Uh, I can imagine. Uh, you know, and this to me seems like a good. Uh, I don't like to use the term so much, but a gateway drug. You know, a good. <laughs> you know, a good game that can introduce families to to having a family game night and something like that. Um, it just looks like a, a really really fun game for everybody. All right, uh, Galactic Netcasts would like to have your support. Uh, if you enjoy what you hear, consider supporting us uh, to help pay for some of our web and audio hosting. Uh, your support for as little as a dollar a month can help us keep the lights on, as it were, and uh, help us grow the network. Uh, when I say network, Galactic Netcasts has a number of shows now. Um, I've almost lost count. Uh, I think we, we're up to uh, five or six different shows. We'll, we'll talk about those different shows in, in a little bit. Uh, but if you are able to support uh, Galactic, Net, Galactic Netcasts with uh, $3 a month, that can get you a monthly newsletter with extra stories related to all of our shows. And at the, at the $5 support level, you can get an extra episode which uh, for each of the podcasts uh, that is available exclusively to our patrons. So uh, if you are so inclined, please go to patreon.com slash galactic netcasts and uh, support us at the level that uh, that you can or feel uh, sh you should support it at if you are so inclined. So, Okay, uh, on to news. Uh, this caught my eye. Uh, I have never heard of day trippers before. And, uh, really? Really? Yes, I have not. And when I saw this, I'm like, oh, this is right up my alley. Uh, Day Trippers Golden Age coming Leap Day, which will be February 29th. Uh, Day Trippers Golden Age Adventures hits online stores in PDF format February 29th with the print edition following soon after. Uh, the book includes 16 role-playing adventures based on Golden Age stories by well-known science fiction writers of the 30s through the 50s. Uh, there's original artwork by uh, Jennifer Bone, Alan Dotson, uh, Chella Faith, and uh, a number of others. Um, let's see, and there are going to be color maps as well. Now, um, <laughs> when we're talking about Golden Age stories uh, from the 30s through the 50s, we're talking about scenarios from uh, based on Philip K. Dick, um, based on I'm trying to look at this uh, list of names here. And well, I think you'd probably have what like uh, maybe Jack Vance or or yep. Paul Anderson maybe. Yes. I'm trying to think oh. of people from from back then. Most of my older stuff is actually fantasy, but yeah. okay, sure, and I. Uh, you know, I, I'm just starting to kind of get into some of Philip K. Dick's work, um, and you know what I have experienced movie-wise. <laughs> uh, I'll lay that out there, movie-wise. <laughs> um, 
and what from a number of my friends who do read Philip K. Dick, it is very much uh, what is reality, what is um, you know, uh, it, it's so suspenseful because you never really know exactly what's happening and what's going on, and he really mastered that style. Have, have you caught any of the Man in the High Castle on Amazon? I have not. That's it, their it, adaptation. It's they they do a pretty solid job. And they that's do. what I've been hearing. That's what I've been hearing. So it is definitely on my bucket list of of things to 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 uh, get into. So, uh, but you know, that said, I. I'm really kind of a nerd for, uh, you know, experienced some of H.G. Wells' work and um, some other uh, writers from that time period. Uh, none of the ones on this list, unfortunately, that they have for the game. But there is a certain, I want to say, almost innocence, because this is at the forefront of that particular genre. Well, and, and they're looking at a lot of the stories. Look at things from a very clear moral black and white perspective. The yes. heroes are heroes. The villains are villains. You're not. You don't have characters wondering, "Gee, should I punch this guy in the jaw?" It's pretty clear that he should. Um, <laughs> and and that makes that makes for, um, it, like you said, it's kind of a more an innocent sort of storytelling. Yeah, and you know that. <sighs> The, 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 like you were saying, the, the fiction, the science fiction of today, there's lots of shades of gray and things like that, and it's just, it's almost refreshing in a way to read older sci-fi because it's 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 straightforward, but just experiencing that history of of the genre and kind of, you know, learning where it all came from and and some of these great stories that really helped inspire some of the re uh, writers that we know of today and just you know getting a taste of that history is, well, especially, is always good especially if you can kind of read them with a split brain if you can look at them and say I can look at this as a work from 1935 or 1940 yes. and read it for what it is and on the other hand look at it critically and say this has got racism problems or this has <laughs> sexism problems. I mean, you read Lovecraft and, and you need to acknowledge that there's problematic material in it. Yes, um, absolutely. And, and that can actually inspire some very interesting discussions. One of the things I've been actually writing a lot lately um, are these uh, neo-pulp uh, stories with a character, uh, The Corpse, who's sort of the spider, the shadow type of thing. Okay. Except it's told with a modern moral framework on it. So as he gets darker and darker and darker and becomes more of a, an agent of vengeance, the reader understands that this guy has just wandered way out into the field now. He, you're not supposed to be supporting him wholeheartedly. You're supposed to be able to see that he is, he is breaking uh, rules that we as a modern audience expect him to follow. Sure. Um, but if you look at it from the framework of what the spider was doing, dropping buildings on bad guys or <laughs> running people over with their cars, um, you know, it's it's all perfectly acceptable. But it creates that dynamic, and and as you interact with those kind of works, you should be able to, as a reader, kind of do the same thing. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I I also think of. Um kind of along that same line when I was reading The Lord of the Rings. In today's world, there would have been a lot of editing. <laughs> it would have been, you know, a little bit more more concise, but, you know, having that extra layer of understanding that, you know, he was creating a genre uh, at that point and, you know, being able to experience that kind of first-generation fantasy is is actually a, a real treat. And, and yeah, and even from the things that he was drawing upon, if you look at the Norse Eddas or you look at the Arthurian material yes. that yep. Tolkien was drawing on, um, those are stories that can have, you know, you read Mallory and that makes Tolkien looks like look like a short story. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, Tolkien's drawing upon that sort of stuff and he's thinking, right, gee, I'm, I'm doing this concisely. Uh <laughs> but uh, but yeah, for the modern audience, you just have to be patient. You have to learn to to kind of accept the works on on one hand, accept the works the way they're presented. Yes, absolutely. So it's really kind of cool to see them uh, 
creating RPG scenarios uh, based around that to get to give you an opportunity to play in those worlds and and experience those works and you know sort of the um, you know the the forefathers as it were of of the genre so uh, that is going to be available for folks it is day trippers golden age adventures which Very is cool. releasing leap day uh, oh gosh just in uh, about a week we can in about a week yeah next yeah, Monday right yep. around the corner so all right. Uh, next up, we have uh, Galactic Gaming News from Ryan Murphy, and he is a regular contributor to Galactic Netcasts, and he covers more of the digital beat of gaming, and he has another update for us. So take it away, Ryan. Okay, thanks for that report, Ryan. Uh, wanted to talk about some of the other shows that Galactic Netcasts has available, and uh, we, we do we deal a lot with... Um, science fiction, uh, nerdy stuff, as it were, uh, like you're listening to Adventure Party right now. Uh, we have other shows like Weird World Weekly, uh, The Alien Invasion, The Sci-Fi Geeks Club, The Podcast of Terror, and uh, some other shows that we call Galactic Net Bites because they are, you know, five minutes in length or so. Uh, you can check out, uh, of the Galactic Net Bites, we have Galactic Gaming News, which you just heard, and uh, Who Knew and Reviews, which it was going to be uh, mostly like Doctor Who news and rumors, but uh, Doctor Who's taking a hiatus for a year. <laughs> yeah, that, that'd be timed if that's yeah. what you're wrong. And uh, uh, I, I feel I feel very bad for Daryl uh, for that. But uh, what he is doing as well is kind of tweaking things a bit, and he is uh, putting in uh, episodes of here's an apocalypse scenario. How do you survive in it, or how would you survive in you know a, a zombie invasion or an alien invasion or different types of uh, of apocalypses uh, to fill in some of those. Um, shows where there aren't a whole lot of Doctor Who rumors or uh, information. So uh, Daryl puts on a heck of a show, so uh, you should check that out, and you can check them all out at gncasts.com. All right, next up is our Kickstarter Spotlight, and last time we looked at the game called Zerpang! You have to <laughs> give that, that emphasis because it does With have the X... With the exclamation points, right? <laughs> yes, and uh, unfortunately, this may be the second game that uh, is not going to hit its goal, <coughs> which is kind of a shame. Uh, currently, with four days to go, they have gotten uh, $8,306 out of their pledged, uh, what they needed for... Uh, to meet their goal, which is thirty-six thousand, so they're whew, it's not looking good. Steep hill. Steep. Yeah, it's a zero hour, and uh, some things need to happen. But uh, as we mentioned in in um, our last show, where we talked about Zerpang, uh, it, it looked a lot like Chinese checkers, but with uh, Opponents, you can have aliens versus gunslingers versus pirates versus robots. Uh, it, <laughs> it seemed like a really, really interesting uh, sort of game. Chinese checkers cross with smash up. Yeah, yeah, kind of like that. And uh, two, to, it was a two. It's two to six players, and a game takes about one to two hours, and it's twelve and up. So, uh, a good family game. Uh, if it were backed, and I, I hope that if they don't get this backed, there's another way that they can find funding to make it happen because it looked like a really, really interesting game. And they got a good, lot of good reviews from the people that uh, checked it out, like uh, Father Geek, All Us Geeks, and uh, shoot. Well, I hope they make it. Uh, but what we're going to do now is not dwell on the past, but look to the future. And Glenn, what do you have? Yes. Well, I don't back the losing horse. <laughs> I picked the horse that has already reached its goal. 
So, <laughs> so that way I, I know I, I'm successful because it's already there. No, I picked Saloon Tycoon. Um, it's a tile building game where you're trying to build the best saloon in the old west. They were looking for twenty thousand dollars. They've already hit twenty five thousand. They still have twenty three days to go. Um, I I like tile games. I like them a lot when you have that variety in what you can do. And this one, you everyone starts with your basic saloon, and you can add on different rooms, both by expanding your saloon outward and also upward by adding more rooms to it. And different rooms will help you attract different people. Uh, some people will be good. However, there will be some that will be bad, because if you have a really ritzy-looking place, you might attract some outlaws. So you have to be careful on what you all build, uh, because you want to attract the right people, not the wrong people. It uh, it just looked really cool to me. Um, I like the I like the building aspect where you're building upwards and outwards. And it just I I like the old west. I mean, I grew up. You know, my dad you know introduced me to all the old John Wayne movies and stuff like that. So I I grew up loving the old west. Um, and you can get in on it for not much. I mean, forty bucks gets you a copy of the game. Uh, they're expecting MSRP to be fifty-five, so you can you know get in on this cheap. Yeah. Uh, first thing, first thing going, and the fact that it's already already reached its goal. I mean, it's it's should be made. So, um, on top of the fact that uh, the guy who made this has done some other Kickstarters as well before. Um, and I just lost it. Page just went away on me. But either way. But, I mean, they hit they hit their goal in the first 48 hours. So that tells me that there's at least some faith from other people out there as well. Um, I don't know. It just looks nifty. And some of the stretch goals, uh, they've already hit. Where was it here? There it is. So, of course, obviously the funded one. Um, they're they've up they're updating the finish on the cards, so they'll have a linen finish. They are replacing the cardboard tokens with uh, gold acrylic nuggets. The next tier, which I think they're going to get, they're going to use thicker material for the tiles. But after that, they start adding expansions, like an uh, underground mini expansion. You can add cellar and a vault. You can add another one. Will add on outhouse and gardens and chapels and libraries, stuff like that. You can also, if you want to. Pony up a little bit more. You can go and pledge at seventy dollars. You get a deluxe copy, which instead of these little uh, acrylic tokens, you get actual fool's gold nuggets <laughs> to be used as gold resource in the games. Because they why come, not? Yeah, and it, it comes in a nice little drawstring burlap sack. So <laughs> it's it's just it 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 for everything I've seen about it, it's it captures that whole you know kind of old west saloon type thing you know and. That just drew me in. Oh, that is that is wonderful, and you know this kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, shoot, what was the game where you built uh, built buildings but on top of meeples that were in inside of the building that we talked well, about. That's, it's uh, ago. Terror in Meeple City. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Rampage. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, they had to change the name. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that said, this uh, yeah, forty bucks. That's that is a good deal, and I too am a sucker for for the Wild West type setting. Um, it's it's so far removed from what we know <laughs> society to be at this point in time. It's really kind of interesting to to look back at that era and uh, and think about where we've come from as a nation, um, and uh, and kind of experience that uh, through game. So forty dollars gets you in the door with the game. Uh, shipping is added later, and the estimated delivery date on this one is August of twenty sixteen. So the end of summer this year. Wow. This could, could be in your hands. So they've got that, a nice nice yeah. timetable there. That tells me everything's just waiting on printing and that's it. 
Yeah, that they're pretty far along if that's what they're looking at. Yep. And and as I said, the the guy who's who's doing this, uh, AJ uh, Porfirio or Porfiro, whatever it is, I mean, he's done several other Kickstarter games, and they've all reached their goals. You know, so he's 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 delivered in the past. So. Which would explain why this has been backed so quickly. Yeah, he's um, done I think seven other the, the six other Kickstarters that have all been successful. So. Yep. Nice. Nice. So, uh, yeah, he's got a, a standing record of uh, quality stuff. Uh, I'm willing to bet if you put out poor games in the past, you're probably not going to get your game funded in the future. So uh, this is a very good indication that uh, he puts together quality games, and uh, this looks like a, another one in a line of games that he has managed to Because if there's one thing we nerds are loud about, it's things we don't like. <laughs> yes. Especially when you get to the fool me six times level here with this guy. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. The internet can be brutal to those who uh, do not deliver the goods. Yes, indeed, and and it and it can be kind to people who who do a good job and and turn things over on time. Absolutely, it's a double-edged sword. So, um, do good by the internets and and the geeks, and uh, you should do okay. So, all right. Well, thank you for that, Glenn. Absolutely. Uh, now, our guest, James Lauder, has the floor. Hey. Uh, <laughs> uh, like I said, I, I really enjoyed the Ravenloft universe and um, the fact that it, when, when Glenn mentioned that he had managed to get a hold of you and you agreed to be on the show, I, I kind of geeked out a little bit. <laughs> because oh, I, I appreciate you asking. So. <laughs> um, well, but, it was it was not the getting a hold of that I expected. I threw a, a blind, who wants to be on the podcast? And James was. The oh, that's very right. First yeah, I, yeah. Because he was the first person right, to reply. That before, so it, <laughs> yes. it was like, hey, you know, I could do that. We've got the Munchkin book coming out. No, that's wonderful, and thank you for for responding and and agreeing to be on the show. Well, it's you know what it's kind of like what you were saying a minute ago about you know being kind to the people who are in this community, mm -hmm. and and that means podcasters, that means people that work at stores, that means you know that part of of the community as well. Sure. No, absolutely. But your current work that we wanted to talk about is the Munchkin book, the official companion. Yes, and indeed. <laughs> when I when I saw that that uh, that had come out, I hadn't really thought about anybody ever writing a, a companion book. How did you get involved with with writing the book? Well, I I had um, I, I actually talked to Phil Reed and um, and then Andrew Hackard at PAX East in 2011 or 2012, hmm. and uh, I had just wrapped up. Um, another book for the same publisher. This is the book, the Munchkin books, part of Ben Bella's Smart Pop line. And the Smart Pop line takes TV, movies, kind of geek culture stuff, and then um, deals with them in a sort of a middle ground way. It's not just fan writing, but it's not hardcore academic stuff. It's why do we take this stuff seriously? What is it about these works that deserves the fan attention and deserves to be considered a little more seriously. So the one I had just wrapped up was on uh, George Martin's Song of Ice and Fire book series. Hmm. And I was talking to Phil about that, and Phil and I sort of both at the same time said, we could do one of these about Munchkin. <laughs> <laughs> and we stood there and looked at each other for a minute and said, okay, we'll have to pursue this. And I left the PAX East gaming hall and called my editor at Ben Bella and said, this is a really, really good idea. Uh, because right from the start, we said, well, you know, and it's a Munchkin product, so we would have to include game rules in it. Uh, and we would want to get everybody involved. Steve Jackson, we'd want to get involved. John Kowalik, we'd want to get involved. You know, the, the people who are putting the game together. Um, and when we did the initial discussions with Steve and John and, and Andrew, everybody was very enthusiastic about participating. And so we sort of realized from that moment that this was a book that was worth pursuing. It was a, an incredible amount of work. Uh, it actually took 
almost four full years from that meeting at PAX East to now, when the book is just shipping formally this week. Um, it took a year to negotiate the contract. It took three years to get all of the content done because Steve Jackson Games is incredibly busy with Munchkin stuff. Sure, yeah. Um, so this was official, so they had to license, they had to uh, go through and do approvals on everything, and that took a long time. And we were dealing with very busy people. Uh, so it, it, it did take a while. But I think it's worth it. I'm very happy with how the book turned out. Okay, if you I, were... T- oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I love the little rule bits you guys put in there with all the... between every chapter. That yes. just is so... Uh. Yeah, so the way that, the way that works, if, if you haven't seen the book, is the, the book as a whole has a rule. It's a Munchkin product. It's got to have a, a game playable rule attached to it. <laughs> and the rule for the book is uh, if you have this book nearby when you're playing you get to pick one of the other game rules in the book, and it's legal for that game. So you get to do this once a day, <laughs> and then there are 18 rules in the book itself, or, or 17, uh, for each of the essays, the introduction, and the foreword. All of them have a, a specific game rule that is derived from the content of the essay. Oh, wow. So... Yeah. Um, and so each one, and that was the, one of the best parts, was actually going through, we'd get the essay approved, and then we would sit down with um, with uh, Andrew Hackard and um, Devin Lewis and Randy Schooneman um, all had input on, on this stuff, and we'd, we'd brainstorm and send stuff back and forth, and I'd send ideas that I'd kicked up when I was when I was editing the, the, the final drafts and then we'd hammer out what the final rule would be to, you know tied to the actual content of the essay. <laughs> How long did it take to come up with rules around the essay? I mean did you like sit down Sur- and have a brainstorming session or surprisingly it- quickly. It it actually did not take us that long. Um, I would like I said I would send as I was working on the essays sometimes I would I would have an idea for um, a rule. And I would send those along on the tail end of the essay, the final version of the essay, for final approval. And about half the time, uh, Andrew and, and uh, the, the real hardcore rules guys over there said, hey, that's actually pretty good. We can, we can do something with this. And half the time they said, uh, no. <laughs> go, go, go edit the next essay. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a game guy. I've done game design, but I'm not. I'm not the Munchkin uh, guy like like Andrew or or Devin or those guys are. And they would come back with two or three, and we'd pick one of them, and then we sent it uh, the, sent the rule over to John Kavalik, and he did an original illustration. So every one of those original game rules has an original piece of of John Kavalik art attached to it too. Oh, that's wonderful. As it should. <laughs> yep, as it as it should. Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely, it should. Uh, y- you talked about editing. When you edit a work that involves the number of writers that you had, and that seems like like a Herculean task. Well, uh, h- how do you go about tackling projects like this uh, as an experienced editor? Um, the the worst ones I've ever had for that, and and Glenn knows these books. I did two books for Green Ronin. Um, Hobby Games the 100 Best, and Family Games the 100 Best. And those had 102 essays in each one by 102 different writers. Wow. Um, from around the globe. So I was exchanging people, uh, exchanging emails with people in, in Belgium, and it was you know 4 o'clock in the morning here, and they would say, we just took our morning coffee break. What time is it there? Why are you up? Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm working on Belgium time today, I guess. Um, and... and I've done now 18 or 19, I, I've actually lost count, anthologies since about, um, since actually, wow, the first one I did was 1990, the okay. first Forgotten Realms anthology, Realms of Valor, that was the, the first one I did. And since that time, I've put together 18 or 19 of them, and you just get used to um, keeping swing tables going, and you know, keeping all the balls in the air at the same time, moving people along. Um, this was a this was a tough project, uh, even even compared to the hundred best, because it was officially licensed. Um, it meant that everybody at Steve Jackson had to be happy with it, 
everybody sure. at the publisher, Ben Bella, had to be happy with it, and it was sort of negotiating that. And the 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 really satisfying part about it at the end, after all of the really you know uh, Miranda Horner and and the other people that that just killed themselves at at uh, Steve Jackson to to help make this happen, we all looked at the book when we were done, and nodded together and said, okay, it was worth it. This, we're we're that happy with how this turned out. Steve uh, sent me an email and 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 said, yeah, thumbs up. But you know, this is what I was hoping the book would be. So. Oh, that's wonderful. That's got to be good to get that kind of feedback. Oh, it is absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and and that the, the the challenge is always having the final book come as close as possible to the book you envisioned when you first proposed it. Sure. So it, it, and and if you can say this is very close to what I thought of when Phil and I had that first uh, discussion at PAX East, um, then, it's a, then it's a success. And I read through the final draft as I was approving the final laid out uh, pages and looking at the game rules and looking at John's new art and the pickup art that we had used to, to illustrate some of the, some of the essays. And, and yeah, it, it, it comes awfully close to what we had hoped it would be. And, oh, and that has to be even more of a monumental task, especially when you have so many people that you need to please and and have on board for this thing to even be finished. So, for you to yes. hit that mark is is truly amazing and wonderful. Yeah, That's and to have and to have both Steve Jackson and Ben Bella say yes, we're happy with how this turned out. You know, yeah. and for the individual authors to say, yeah, that final version of my piece is what I was hoping it would be too, and so I'm happy with it and. Um, that that more than anything else in, in terms of editing for me is what I've learned since since working in the book division at TSR is I'm much more um, writer focused than I was uh, when I first was learning the rope learning the ropes um, I want to treat people's work how I want my own work treated when I'm the one on the other side of the desk sure. when I'm the writer this is how I would want somebody to approach my stuff and Generally, you can't go wrong. The writers are the writers are generally uh, very, very happy with how I treat their stuff, and and I'm very respectful of it. I'm I the book is nothing without them. You know, I I can edit yeah. this all day long, but if I don't have great piece pieces from from all the people at Steve Jackson and Jane Gates and Joseph Scrimshaw and Lee McIntyre, you know, who was editing uh, uh, sending me emails from different film sets and. Uh, various and sundry things as as he was working on his piece. Uh, uh, Liam did uh, a, a thing called uh, Munchkin Hollywood where he writes about what it's like sort of surviving in Hollywood as if it were a Munchkin game with everybody set, setting around the table. <laughs> Le Liam, Liam is playing, uh, he was Spartacus on the Stars series and he uh, he's weather wizard on the Flash these days. He's doing a bunch of other stuff too. Um, gigantic Munchkin fan, big gamer geek <laughs> guy. Um, and so uh, you know, being able to to sort of share enthusiasms with the people working on the book is is a great part of it as well. No, oh, that's really cool. And uh, you know, that has to be very difficult being an editor where. You know, you need to keep you need to keep the troops happy, but also you need to deal with the higher ups and you know keeping things on track and making sure that you know the the people higher up the chain are, are happy as well. Yeah. Um, how you know you said I mean you had you had to grow into that to be to be that level of editor. How how does how does somebody learn to be a good editor just beyond you know taking a few hard knocks here and there? I mean, what's what? How would you go about doing that? Well, for for me, I think a good editor is somebody who can look at a piece of work that's in progress, and figure out ways to help the author clarify his or her vision. Okay. I need to look at that work like I'm simultaneously editing and reading it. I'm the audience, but I'm also the, the referee and I need to look at things and flag them where the author isn't being clear or the story is blogging down or there's description missing or or the logic is weak and point these things out to the writer and say here's where I think this is what you're trying to achieve this is where I don't think you're reaching it and then it's a dialogue 
and most of the time the, the writer will come back and say, wow, yeah, that's, that's right, Th those things are, are problems. Sometimes they'll say, no, I like it the way it is, and that's okay too because the writer's name goes on the work at the end of the day. Um, and so, you know, editors need to understand where that line is. Um, and, uh, and partly it's, uh, you know, being able to sympathize w w from my own position as a writer. Um, sure. you know, I'm not there to co-write this stuff for somebody. I'm there to help them clarify their vision. Just really kind of shepherding the author to, to right. polish the work. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly it. And, I mean, your relationship with different writers is going to be different. There are some people who really want you to, they finish their first draft, they're not protective of the language that they have on the page, so they're okay with you, oh my god, there's you know, 57 adverbs on this page, I'm just going to do <laughs> search LY and just start killing them randomly here. Um, sure. And there are some authors, if you've worked with them before, you can, you, you know, you can do that. Um, it's part of the relationship, and different editors work well uh, with different writers. I, I learned that. That's something I learned actually very quickly at, at TSR because um, uh, Bill Larson, one of the one of the editors we had, um, had people like Doug Niles. He worked with regularly. Yeah. Doug loved working with Bill. Um, uh, Eric Larson was Bob Salvatore's uh, first editor for. Mm -hmm the first bunch of Drist books. Um, Eric wasn't a gamer, but he was much more aware of sort of a general audience um, perspective on the work. So he helped Bob. Bob was a gamer. Bob didn't need anybody telling him how the game rules worked. Bob sure. already had that down. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he needed somebody to help him make the story broader so that it appealed to more than just a gamer audience. So I think if Bob hadn't been working with initially Mary Kirchhoff and then Eric Severson, um, I don't think Drift would have taken off the way it, it had. It's that initial stuff that their input. Um, and then there were other authors like Elaine Cunningham, um, you know, different people that I worked with uh, who really put on, the, put on the armor and expected me to come back with red ink all over the pages and, <laughs> and say, wow, what is this? Um, and when we sometimes switched um, uh, editing assignments, we found out that that the authors, you know, the first couple of times I edited Bob Salvatore, he was for the two first two uh, Realm short story anthologies. He called me back and said, "What the hell?" Because <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like what you know, Eric is very mild mannered, soft spoken guy. He was just perfect for working with Bob. And Bob would got the pages that I bled all over with with comments <laughs> and corrections. And what's this? Uh, and so. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it really that's that's something else that you need to be aware of is everybody's looking for kind of slightly different things from from an editing uh, from an editing process. So you really have to be kind of almost chameleon-like, being able to manage folks in different fashions as how they re better respond. Yes, and and that's you you have a you you try and find a good workable baseline. This mm -hmm. is how I will treat everybody. Everybody gets this level of respect from me, and I show sure. and I make clear up front that you know they're the author. I'm not there to rewrite them. Um, make it clear this is what my my general approach is. But different authors, I can if I've worked with somebody a few times, I can send things back with, oh, you've got to be kidding me, uh, you know, in the margins for <laughs> for for a fight scene that doesn't work, or you know, ah, this is terrible. Where I might not say that to somebody. Who I I uh, uh, I hadn't worked with before. Elaine Cunningham actually um, dedicated one of her uh, Forgotten Realms books to me, and in the dedication said, "Put the red pen down now and just read it," <laughs> 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 which was lovely. Elaine, I love working with Elaine, and and, and that that so summed up our relationship. Uh, that, that was just marvelous. <laughs> Uh, getting back to uh, to the Munchkin book, uh, there's a lot of people that were involved with it. Did you did you pick them? Yes. Or okay. Yeah. Um, so so Steve Jackson, the, what I did initially was uh, Phil and I sat down and said, here's a list of people we would want involved. And if um, I suggested somebody they found problematic, or they suggested somebody I found problematic, that's the time to say. We've worked with them in the past. Maybe that's not a good fit. You know, 
we don't know if they can write funny. Um, that was one of the harder parts of the Munchkin book, to be able to do the balance of serious things on, say, game theory or... Uh, Joseph Scrimshaw did a wonderful piece on the theory of comedy and how that works with Munchkin. And that's the fairly sententious, serious stuff. Um, but still do that in an entertaining way and still be funny while you're doing that. That's a trick. Not a yeah. lot of people can write that sort of stuff. So um, we, Steve Jackson and I came up with the initial list. And then I expanded that and uh, contacted other people I had worked with, and I had other people I'd worked with on uh, Andrew Zimmerman Jones, who did the piece on game theory, with somebody who had done an essay for me for the um, uh, Ice and Fire Game and Thrones book. So I had other people that I knew might be interested in this sort of topic, and, and sort of went from there. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's names I... When I first got the the preview copy, there were names I expected to see that I saw. Obviously, John Kovalik. I expected to see Matt Forbeck in there. Yep. But then I run across other names, and they aren't ones that would have ever popped in my head, even though, uh, like Bonnie Burton. Right. <laughs> I, I love Bonnie. I, yep. I, I, I have many of many of her books on my shelf behind me. I mean, and, uh, it she would have never crossed my mind, but I love her section in it, the whole and flirting 101. Yes, and Jennifer, <laughs> Jen Jennifer Steen's piece is the same. Yes, Bonnie's piece and Jennifer's piece. Um, uh, Jennifer's piece, and she does the Genisodes, uh, Genisodes podcast. Um, hers is sort of this screw tape letters formatted, letters from the monsters to yeah. the monkeys. Oh, and so the first so one wonderful. starts off very polite. Dear adventurers, I'm sure we've had this misunderstanding <laughs> when you got lost in our dungeon last night and just accidentally kicked down the door and stole all our stuff. Uh, and the four letters just get angrier and angrier and angrier as they go. And you're not seeing what the munchkin response is, but you're filling it in in your head. Yep. Um, and, uh, yeah, Jennifer did a, a, a swell job on that. And Bonnie uh, did, a, did a great job with, with her flirting piece. And Bonnie was somebody I would not worked with before, but I had seen her work. And I, when I was looking at people, to, who would I like to reach out to and say, would you be interested in doing something for this project? She was, she was one of the people who got brought in that way. I, I'm, I'm a fan of her work. Yeah, we uh, actually had an opportunity to uh, interview Bonnie on uh, Sci-Fi Geeks Club. And mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, in, in having a conversa an extended conversation with her, yes, she would absolutely be a perfect fit for, for something like this. And that's, yes. that's, yep. that's awesome that you got she, her to She's to smart do and funny and, you know, oh, yeah. writes well and, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. So that's, <laughs> and so that's how the people got... got um, got brought in. There were some people like Randy Schooneman, who's the, um, he was the demo king for, uh, for Munchkin. So he wrote the piece on how, how demos get put together for conventions um, and, and um, the process behind uh, all of that, which there are different aspects of this book. If you're a game designer, you're a, you're a fledgling game publisher. There are things that you can actually learn from this. If you read Andrew Hackard's piece on how they come up with a Munchkin set, you'll actually see things about the revision passes and and the amount of play testing that goes into a, a game like this. That might be news to you. If you read the piece on, I learned things on the demo piece, which was awesome too. Um, I've done conventions for different companies over the years, but I've never actually done design demos. I've run demos at booths, but I haven't designed them. And so Randy's piece was a, was a, a revelation for that. Um, and uh, Colin Lundberg uh, is involved with the Irish uh, games auctions, which Munchkin, and this was, again, something I learned during the course of the book, um, Steve, and, Steve Jackson and John Kovalik do a lot of work with the Irish game conventions, and through their charity auctions, they give tons of money to children's charities in Ireland. Oh, so wow. they draw people into John has gone over there, and they've auctioned off. You get to be drawn into a Munchkin card. <laughs> and then they donate that money to, um, uh, to the children's charities. And so through that, Munchkin is actually you know, a big part of, of that whole Irish game convention charity <laughs> auction thing, which, again, was a really kind of a revelation to me. Uh, I, I knew that they did the auctions. I knew that they were involved in the charities. 
they were identified a, a couple of years ago in the Diana Jones Award, but I hadn't realized Munchkin played such a big part in them. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, really, for those of you who are, are listening to this episode, uh, yeah, you know, we talk. Uh, we've talked a bit about in the past, and we've spoken with a number of game designers. If you are looking to design your own game or become a better game designer, this this book will definitely have material that will help you think about that and and give you a lot of insight and and helpful hints on, on how to how to be better at it so yeah yeah or even just how to how to look at things from a game designer point of view or a game sure. a game publisher point of view uh, those perspectives are always helpful absolutely that's absolutely invaluable if you're looking to to get into that professionally or or to finish designing that game that you've always wanted to make so right yep this would be absolutely helpful uh, in in that quest. So, uh, are there any Munchkin stories that uh, of your own that you'd like to share? Oh yes, with the game itself or as a Munchkin player? Because I go back to my I'm actually a late seventies D and D guy. I started playing D and D in the in the late seventies, sure. and uh, when I first got my job at at TSR in the late eighties, I started there in eighty eight. Um, I could not help but come across as the munchkin in every conversation I had. Uh, <laughs> because when you're talking to, you know, Jeff Grubb or you've got to call Ed Greenwood on the phone um, or, you know, or Zeb Cook, uh, you, you just can't help but come across as the green newbie. Uh, it, <laughs> it's just inevitable. <laughs> oh, that's... I'm... Yeah, this is absolutely wonderful, and I'm really glad that we got a chance to talk to you, James. And uh, um, it, please, if if you have any other projects that you're working on, we would love to have you back on the show. Oh, thanks very much, and thanks for asking. This is this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, next up here, we're going to do our hello. My name is and Glenn. We we got a submission. What? What? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's been a little while. Uh, Tony. Uh, from Montrose, Colorado, uh, sent us the character from uh, the uh, fifth edition of D and D, and oh, I'm probably going to hack up this name horribly. Lianna Le Lanolin, Lianna Le Lanolin, I sold is the name. Uh, this character uh, is an average build human male with brown hair. One blue eye, one green eye, and pale skin. Uses a spear with an obsidian point as a staff. Mostly raised himself in the woods with a slight help from a, of a primate tribe of humans and wild animals. That is a very interesting background. I'd be curious to know what type of character. Is it a, a druid or a fighter? Uh, Tony, if you could uh, contact us back and give us a little follow-up on the character, uh, would love to hear more about it. But thank you very much, Tony, for for sending this in and uh, giving us a chance to talk about your character. Uh, you will be getting a certificate in email, uh, thanking you uh, essentially for sending this to us, and uh, this will be suitable for framing uh, after you print it out. Um, and uh, you'll be getting that within the next week here. So thank you very much, Tony, for taking the time to do that. And uh, for those of you listening or watching, uh, Hello, My Name is is the opportunity for us to highlight a character that you enjoy playing. It also gives us an opportunity, if it's a character that you play in a system that... Um, you know, is maybe not mainstream or gives us a chance to kind of talk about um, adventures that we might have had playing uh, uh, Role Master from Iron Crown Enterprises or, you know, other, um, I'm trying to think, Traveler or GURPS or Ooh, any tra yeah, system. The ones of Vigilantes. <laughs> See, oh, the I The ones of Vigilantes does not get enough love. It does not. And I had a, uh, when I lived in Lacrosse, I had a, a friend who ran Villains and vil Vigilantes, and I... Oh, I had a character that I named Cipher, and of course, this is long before the Matrix, and he had like <laughs> he had darkness powers. So I mean, it was really kind of cool to, <clears throat> and this was like a renaissance for me. Like at that point in time, uh, I had only played 
you know, second edition D and D, and then I discovered White Wolf, and then I discovered, you know, Villains and Vigilantes, and uh, uh, Justifiers, and you know, Gosh, all these yeah. other, you know, cr- you know, to me at the time, crazy game systems, and and exploring worlds that I never thought had existed in role playing games. So. That's what Hello My Name is. It's just an opportunity for us to talk about some of these maybe more esoteric game systems and talk about the characters that uh, you've created and you enjoy playing. So thank you very much, Tony. And like I said, your certificate will be coming in the email uh, within the next week here. So Send me your Star Frontiers love. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, you know, I never, I always wanted to play Star Frontiers, and nobody I knew ever ran it, so, uh, but I know how much you absolutely love that game system. So, uh, yeah, uh, any game system that you've played, any character that you've played, we would love to talk about it, so uh, feel free to hit us up at, uh, uh, boy, uh, galacticnetcast.com, I had a uh, c- complete brain breakdown there. GNCast.com. Uh, if you go to GNCast.com slash adventure, now that we, we've uh, made some tweaks to our URLs and uh, kind of shortened some things up, GNCasts.com slash adventure takes you directly to the Adventure Party page, and we have a link off in the upper right-hand side, uh, which is a square a graphic image that says hello my name is and you click on that and there's a short form for you to fill out with your name your email address where you're from your character's name the system and boy that sounds like a lot of stuff it really isn't I swear to you just some basic info a little bit about the character a little bit about yourself and a little bit of why, about why that character that you play is so cool um, I do ask for your email, but like I said, I email you back a certificate suitable for framing as a thank you for taking the time to let us talk about your character. I don't spam people. I have zero interest in that. that that's not what this is about. This is just merely a way to connect with you, and thank you for taking the time to uh, share some information about you and the game systems that you play. So. Uh, if you want to find out more about our meetings, uh, the show notes for each of the meeting and uh, contact information for the show, you can go to, like I said before, gncasts.com slash adventure. Uh, you can find and follow us on Twitter or join our Facebook group by using the Facebook search term Galactic Netcasts. And you'll also be able to find our social media outlets by clicking on the links on our website. Uh, you can find our YouTube channel uh, where you can go to see video versions of the Adventure Party meetings at youtube.com slash galactic netcasts. Uh, if you're using iTunes or Stitcher, please take a moment and give us a, a review and let us know what you think. Uh, your reviews, whether they're positive or negative, can help us shape the show and make it better. Uh, that's what this is all about. Uh, if it's if it's not entertaining, hey, let us know what we need to tweak. We would love to get your feedback and see what we can do. Uh, you can leave feedback by emailing adventure at gncasts.com. You can also call or text the number 805-328-3966. Again, 805-328-3966. And you can leave a voice message or a text message. You can also go to gncasts.com and uh, on the lower left hand corner there is a leave us a message and if you have a microphone attached to your computer you can leave us a voice message message that way. James, I want to thank you so much again for taking the time to speak with us. Where can people find out more about you and what you're working on? Uh, best place right now is probably Facebook. Um, if you look for the James Louder on Facebook that's talking about movies or games or things like that, that'll be me. Um, I've got a web page, but it's under reconstruction right now. It was it was terribly outdated and sad, so okay. I, t- I took it down for a, for a, a revamp. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Glenn, once again, thank you, and I hope you feel better soon because oh boy this has been kicking your keister since Thursday so um, yeah, I, got, I got another con to go to next this coming weekend oh no oh. where you can oh. spread your joy <laughs> yes <laughs> better talk I'm coming for you 
or collect Concrud V2. Uh, I, I hope that that is not the case. But uh, where can people find out more about you, Glenn, and uh, what you do, what you're doing, and about Mist Runner? You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on YouTube with uh, the BB Bunker at Guy in a Bunker, or just follow me on Twitter, Guy in a Bunker. And uh, just to note that the name has changed. It has. It is now Guy in a Bunker. So. It is no longer Naked Hobo. I went with something a little more Google search friendly. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, I applaud you for making that decision. I'm a little sad that I won't be able to giggle like a 10-year-old boy when I hear that, but, you know, it, it's a smart decision that you made, and, and uh, it, it's going to work out for you. I know it. Uh, you know, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, listening or watching The Adventure Party. Uh, may your characters never die, and your adventures always be epic. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>